OK. So now it is um, stochastic processes theory, general theory of stochastic processes, not really, because that's what the French did. Uh, so it's <laughs> general coupling theory of stochastic processes, which is closer to the truth, but not the full truth. It's a particular kind of, of, uh, of coupling that I will be looking at, or couplings, plural. Okay, so we will now, for the next uh, half, half hour or so, be considering um, the following um, framework so this is T time for a stochastic process and um, here is the process and it's got a state space um, we could call it something, uh, E or something, um, but better not to call it anything. Uh, and we will be considering two processes which we are going to couple. Uh, And I'm, of course, starting uh, with the third slide. <laughs> I have something I wanted to do before this, but let's do this preparation. Um, so they are going to be uh, processes on a Polish state space. So it means that the state space is complete and separable. You can think of the real line, that's fine. Or d-dimensional space, uh, Euclidean space. I put this for technical convenience. I put this uh, uh, as a condition with paths in d space. the Skorohot space. So this means simply that the paths are not continuous as I drew them here, uh, but they, um, they have limits from the right. They, they, they are continuous from the right and they have limits from the left. So they be, can be quite wild, but uh, just to indicate that this is a path it should have be right continuous with left hand limits. Okay, and uh, now I'm going to <laughs> say uh, stop here and um, go to um, what I actually intended to do now. It's of course, I was going into the general theory too early. Uh, I want to show you the classical coupling of Markov chains. So you probably heard about it, I will have to do it here. So, time is not a T, but N, it's discrete time. And for convenience, let the state space be N. It's a countable state space. Could be finite also. Not necessarily infinite. Uh, and uh, the chain, this is uh, the first state, x0. Then it jumps to the next. and jumps on through life. So
in this standard Markovian way that if you know where you are at this time n, then the future is just like restarting the chain from this state and is independent of the past. So you constantly forget where you came from, just remember where you are. Okay, so let the transition matrix be P and let pi be the stationary vector. So I'm assuming irreducible aperiodic, uh, which is standard. And then on top of that, I exclude transient states, transient chains. I, let's just consider recurrent chains. In the case of positive recurrence, then uh, it is well known uh, and proved in the first courses on Markov chains that there exists a stationary distribution in that case. But uh, it is also true that in a non-recurrent case, there exists a stationary vector. A vector, so non-negative entries and pi times p is pi again. In the positive recurrence case, we can choose pi so that the sum is one. Here is the basic limit theorem. If x is positive recurrent, then the probability of being in, in j at time n tends to stationarity, to pi j. Sorry, too early. I want to prove this, uh, just show you the idea of proof. It is, if you haven't seen it, this, this is the first example of coupling that I was exposed to consciously. <laughs> and I was, wow. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what you do is um, let x prime be independent of x, x prime zero distributed as pi. So let this chain be green. So it starts somewhere and then it jumps somewhere and then maybe it jumps into the same state as, as um, the blue chain. But from there, it continues independently somehow. Now, in the positive recurrent case, it is easy to prove uh, that, um, that this t, that this time that uh, the chains meet is uh, finite with probability 1. So what do we have here then? Well, we have a stationary chain. And OK, one more thing. Uh, define a new chain, um, x double prime. Uh, do it this way. I'll just do it on, on the board. Uh, start in the same state as x prime starts. Let it follow x prime until it hits the blue chain, then switch to the blue chain. This x prime is a Markov chain, and it's got initial distribution pi, so it is also stationary. So what we have here now, a blue chain develops through time, and in the end it hits a red chain, which is stationary. So the blue chain is asymptotically stationary. It behaves like a stationary chain in the end. And that uh, can be turned into this in a way that you will see in a second or a minute. But I want to make some, um, some advertisement for the null recurrent case, because no one seems to have noticed that uh, there is a proof there too, which is not too technical. Uh, so in the null recurrent case, this goes to zero. So you can't do the same trick. You can't start a stationary chain and do the same trick. So what do you do? 
Well, you can do this. In the null recurrent case, the sum of the pi's is infinite, but we shall now truncate it. So pi k is just like pi up to and including k. So you take all the pi's and normalize it in a finite window, space window, not time window. So this is not a stationary distribution, but this is true. If you take this pi k, k is not a power, it's an index or a superscript. Take this pi k times pn, this will always be less than that, whatever n is. And here is a proof. Uh, this is less than that, obviously, because pi k is zero, so it is equal to that for i up to and including k, and then it's zero, so it's always less than that. And then multiply by pn on both sides, and you get this. You get um, this, and you get this, and then use this to get pi there. So you see what the trick is now. Take k large, then for a fixed i, well, whatever i is, take k large, this will be close to zero. So it means that you can start a chain in a finite window, which is large enough to make the probability of being in i uniformly small, almost zero. So now let x, this guy, start with this distribution, do the same thing here. Uh, in the case, here comes in a little complication. It's possible that they never meet. But in that case, it's a half-line proof to show that the limit is zero. I'm dropping that. Uh, so in the case when this is finite with probability one, we go through the same argument. Uh, this chain, the red chain, has small probability of being in some i here. The blue becomes like the red chain, so it also has a, a tiny probability of being there. So send that tiny probability to zero, and you get this. Okay. Next comes um, a, a very ambitious talk there. This talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next comes Brownian motion. In the afternoon, I will talk about Brownian motion coupling of Brownian motion, really, but in a different kind of coupling, which will come up in, in uh, some minutes. But this is just a side, a uh, little comment here. Um, so Brownian motion, standard Brownian motion, uh, starting somewhere. B0 equal to x. Uh, start another Brownian motion, B0 up above, B mart 0 equal to y. Draw the midline here. Run this Brownian motion until it happens to hit this midline. This is what x plus y divided by 2. Reflect it. Then this point goes there, and um, I am no good at reflecting. <laughs> ah, so, well, it's going to be, uh, it's going to go there. <laughs> this is sure to happen with probability one. This is t. Let them move in the same way after that. So this is called reflection coupling of Brownian motion. Okay, this kind of coupling, which was used here and here, is called, uh, for lack of a better, better word, it's called exact coupling because the processes meet exactly and stay exactly together from there on. From then on, from there on. Uh, when I was uh, in, in, the late, yeah, well, in the late 80s, I was only aware of this kind of coupling. So this was what was called coupling. And I met lots of people who still use this, the word coupling only for this type of coupling. 
Uh, okay, so that's a confusion that I want to sort of sort out that I'm using coupling in a much broader sense, and this is called exact coupling. Some people call it classical because it's the same thing as in this classical case, and some call it the Dublin coupling because and uh, the classical coupling, this coupling went, goes back to Dublin in the 30s, 1937, I think. He did it when he was in his early 20s and he died when he was 25. Then he left a lot of stuff that was put in a safe at the French Academy. And it was the family didn't allow anyone to open it until year 2000. And there was a proof of the Ito formula a few years before Ito. I'm told, I haven't looked at this. It was a, an amazing guy, but he died in the war. Yes, exact coupling. Here is the definition. And this is the picture. So we need the shift. So if we take T here, and let this be a new origin, this is the origin zero, um, then theta t z is z from t like that. It's the post t process. And um, the picture, the exact coupling picture, is this one. Uh, here is one process, set hat. Here is another process, set hat prime. And they coincide from time t onward. t is called the coupling time. And t can be infinite. It not, need not necessarily meet in this definition. But if they meet with probability one, then the coupling is successful, like the couplings over here. OK, I will now go fast. There is a key inequality. This looks so. If you shift to t and look at the process from there onwards, the whole thing, not only the value at time t, then the distributions will be uh, the probability, the total variation will be less than twice the tail of t. And why is that? I will just indicate it by a picture. Um, take a t here. This event, if you call it c, that's the reason I introduced the coupling event. Uh, it is a coupling event for those two guys. The, the, the hatted guys are identical from there on. So the total variation is less than or equal to twice the complement of this, which is this. What is this good for? Well, this is typically used in the case when we can choose Z prime stationary. Stationary means that this probability does not depend on T. Then this doesn't depend on T, so this thing here goes to a stationary limit in total variation if t is finite with probability 1. So you need this to go to 0. This is sort of, I think, the main reason people got interested in, in if that's how it is used here. Uh, but note that here we discussed only what's happening at a fixed time. Here we have the whole future. We could have done the same thing here. But that's not very interesting because it follows from Mark Markov property. But here, this can be used beyond Markov processes. An example is um, 
let me just run it in, 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 in the air. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let me draw a picture here. Application. Ah. Uh, regenerative process. It's a process like this. It starts somewhere until it regenerates, like a Markov chain hitting a fixed state. Then it does it again and again and again. So this is set. Take a stationary version of it. Set prime. I draw it in this direction. Uh, it comes in here, regenerates, regenerates, and if time, yeah, you might wonder if if they actually meet. This is set prime. If they regenerate at the same time. If they do, you can let them just go on like that. Well, typically, in continuous time, you would have um, uh, continuous uh, return times, continuous regeneration times, continuously distributed with densities, so they wouldn't meet unless you created some clever dependence that sort of forced them to meet, and you can do that. So for regenerative processes with finite mean, with, 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 uh, with, um, with um, cycle lengths having densities, with finite mean, you can construct such a coupling where t is finite. So this theory here works in that case, and there is a stationary version. So this works for regenerative processes, and then it works for another, several other classes of processes. But the regenerative is the most natural one extension of Markov chains. OK, here comes a set of equivalences. There exists a sexual exact coupling if and only if you have total variation convergence. Well, you have seen that if t is finite, this will go to 0, so this implies that. It's not clear that this implies that. OK, uh, but it does. I'm not showing you the proof. That's not easy. That's the difficult thing here. Um, and then those two are also equivalent to a very clean and nice distribution of property. The distribution of the two processes coincide on the tail sigma algebra. So D is the sigma algebra in path space. This is all sets in D that only depend on what happens after time little t, at time little t or later. And this is the intersection of all such sets. And um, that's the tail sigma algebra, things that only depend on what happens far in the future. Uh, return to a fixed set infinitely often, or in an unbounded set, is, is an example of a, of a tail set. Okay, so these three things are equivalent. And here, go to Markov processes, general Markov processes, under some regularity conditions, uh, mild. The above claims uh, hold for all differently started versions of a Markov process if and only if we have tail triviality. That is, if and only if tail events have either probability 0 or probability 1, where whatever initial distribution you have. So things in the far future are either certain or impossible. This is, now here is an uh, analytical condition. This is equivalent to bounded space-time harmonic functions being constant and just doing this fast, and a mixing condition. The Markov process is mixing. All these are equivalent. Equivalent, 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 equivalent. So now I will do, I really do want to, to finish the whole thing. So OK, this was exact coupling. How about almost coupling? It's, it's wise. To, to go to the regenerative case for 
for that. If you have a regenerative process, a renewal process, just don't think about what's happening in space. Just think about the renewal process. So you have, the, you have a light bulb, the one that's burning at time zero, burns out here, you put in a new one, put in a new one, and so on. You have the sequence of, of, um, of um, uh, times, renewal times. And here is another sequence, let it run independently. So you have two rooms <laughs> lit by independent bulbs. Uh, and um, they will never be changed exactly at the same time in this model. But in the, infinite, in the finite mean cycle length case, when this is, has finite mean, positive recurrent case, then it is, can be proved that they actually come epsilon close. So this interval here is less than or equal to epsilon. So you can prove that this happens for regenerative processes with finite mean non-lattice, actually, um, uh, this uh, cycle distribution need not be continuous. Non-lattice, that's the interesting thing. In the continuous case, you can actually make them meet, meet but here, in, in if you have, for instance, Russian things, it, cycle lengths concentrated on the rationals, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that, uh, but you can make them go epsilon close. So what happens then? Well, then you have almost coupling or epsilon coupling. Do that fast. This was exact coupling. A whole, this page sort of collects a theory for exact coupling. Here comes epsilon coupling. What is epsilon coupling? It is just what you get when you add an extra time, so that the difference of the two times is less than epsilon. That's what I was drawing here. This is t, and this is t prime. And the difference is less than epsilon. So we need this to hold when t is finite. So it's possible that this never happens in general definition. OK, so is there a key inequality? Yes. I will do this very fast. So now comes this uniform U. What do you do? Look at this inequality we had before. This one is going to turn into the other one by red marks. So you take an, instead, in, in addition to T, you take an H. And to T, you add U plus H. So you think of H as small. So you take a small interval and you select uniform point in the interval. This is really taking the origin and smoothing it, making it blurry. So you don't know exactly where the origin is. It's, it's somewhere in this small interval. That's what this is doing intuitively. Then you take the tail and you multiply t by u. Wrong. This is wrong. This shouldn't be a u there. Sorry? This is just the same thing as we had before. It should just be a t there. But there is a correction term. Twice the epsilon divided by h. So what happens if there exists, if there exists for all epsilon a successful coupling? Epsilon coupling. This happens. First, you send t to infinity here. Then you take lim inf of this, or lim soup of this, sorry, is less than or equal to, this goes to zero, it's less than or equal to this. Lim soup of this is less than or equal to this. There is no epsilon on this side, so send epsilon to zero. So this thing here goes to zero. First t to infinity, this disappears, then epsilon to zero, this disappears. So this has then a limit, and we have a limit result. In the stationary case, it looks like this. This thing here tends to a stationary limit. U is independent of this z, is that 
You, yes, so you take a uniform random variable which is independent of everything else. You just extend your space, if you like, by, by the Lebesgue interval. Yeah, independent and uniform. Did I have, ah, okay, it's not easy to read, maybe. It blends with the blue. Okay, so you have this. Now, equivalences. Yes, I will do this fast. There are equivalences. For all epsilon, you have successful epsilon coupling. I am calling this almost coupling. So for all epsilon, you have successful, you have epsilon coupling, that is, the collection of couplings is then uh, almost coupling. You can't get them together exactly, but you can get them together as close as you like. Okay, so you can do that if and only if this thing here goes to zero, if and only if the two guys have the same distribution on the particular sigma algebra that you should all sit down and study. It's not been studied. This was published 15, 18 years ago. <laughs> and this is a very interesting sigma algebra. It is generated by smoothed functions, tail function. You take a tail function and you smooth it with a poor. So you blur it. And so you get a sub-sigma algebra of the tail. I call it the smooth tail. And they are the same on the smooth tail. And that's, these functions are quite natural. Just, you just integrate over a finite interval. OK, and what about Markov processes? Yes. Exactly the same theory. Uh, S triviality instead of tail triviality, smooth tail triviality, okay. Smooth space-time harmonic functions, constant, whatever they are, and the Markov process is smoothly mixing. Okay, this is epsilon coupling. And now I'm taking the third variant of this stuff, shift coupling. It turned out, I started working on this with David Alters slightly more than 20 years ago, and it turned out that shift coupling is, I'm talking about it in the afternoon, and it's, um, it's sort of popping up in many contexts. So what is shift coupling? It is not exact coupling, it is not epsilon coupling, but, okay, I'm leaving it, epsilon coupling, going back to exact coupling. This is the slide for exact coupling, sort of the standard coupling. And now we start on shift coupling. Shift coupling means adding an extra time, exactly the same condition as for epsilon coupling, except we don't assume that they are epsilon close. So the picture here is, uh, is, um, like this, I like to see it like this. You have um, the origin of um, you, the origin of of zeta, and you have the origin of zeta prime. They start at different origins. This process develops, and this process, oops, this one also, until they meet, and this length here is t prime, and this length here is, is t t. So they are the same up to a random shift. And this actually, I met uh, David Blackwell almost 30 years ago in, in Berkeley, and I was telling him about my I was so excited about my exact coupling stuff. And he looked at it and said, why do you need them to meet at the same time? And I said, oh, what is he talking about? <laughs> OK, so it turned out that a few years later, it was shift coupling. Uh, it wasn't that he, I started working on it then, but I, I, I now know what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, OK, so is there a theory? Yes, there is. Everything goes over to shift coupling. This becomes this. U, U is uniform on, on uniform and independent. 
So what you do here, rather than in the epsilon coupling case, you blur the origin, shift it to t. Now what we do is you take a full interval from 0 to t, think of t large. You take a uniform point on it and look up things from there. Why not do that? Why does it need to be a fixed t? Why not take a uniform? Anyway, so there is an inequality. You multiply t by u, u, and u, and here you put in the maximum of the two. So here is the inequality. How about, well, you are getting used to this now. <laughs> this goes to the stationary one. So Cesaro total variation convergence. Because picking up a point at un uniformly in a large interval is just like averaging the distributions of the different shifts over that interval. So it can call it cesaroing the distributions. Okay, why not? Why is this not an interesting thing to have? Why does it need to be a fixed T? Equivalences, yes. <sighs> Same stuff, and now enters the invariant sigma algebra. All path sets that don't depend on where the origin is. An example of that would be all paths that visit a particular state um, in an unbounded time. It doesn't matter where the origin is. It will always, you can always tell if you are in the set or not. And there is a theory here. The only thing that changes is that the invariant enters. So triviality on invariant sets. That is what some people call, and I call, ergodicity. Zeta is ergodic, if this holds. Some people say that zeta is ergodic if there is the tail there, but I don't think that's good because it clashes with ergodic theory, which is a whole theory on its own, which uses this condition on, on in, for invariant sets. Okay, what more? There is more. I will do it one thing per minute or something like that. So shift coupling actually, um, it's natural to, it's natural here I'm saying, to, to look at the two-sided time for shift coupling. So here is a process, and here is the origin of zeta prime, and here is the origin of zeta, and call the distance here s. If we have a single process with the property that um, zeta is the process seen from here, and zeta prime is the process, and this should be hats, like here, this should be hats. Um, same process with different origins. That's the thing you have here, except that in shift cup, in a two-sided case, you would need this path to follow that one backward. Uh, you know, you, uh, in, in the one-sided case, they can be different until they meet and then they are the same. In the two-sided case, shifting, if you shift in the two-sided case, the shift is going to be like this, there won't be, notice now, there won't be a plus here. So the shift is now two-sided. So when you shift, you don't lose the past. You don't cut off the past. So that is a big difference between shift coupling in, in two-sided time and in, um, in um, one-sided time. Okay. So what about the theory? Here is some preparation for the theory. I will skip it very fast. There is a theory. There are no Markov processes there yet, at least. Um, you have to um, skip the Mar Markov process thing. But there is, here is the definitions. They are the same when you shift differently. And note that um, we take S here to be T minus T prime. 
then theta t theta is equal to theta t prime theta prime holds if and only if theta s theta is equal to theta prime. In the two-sided case, uh, because then you just subtract this on this side, because you, you keep the knowledge of full path both directions. So this is shift coupling in two-sided time, and the whole theory works except the Markov chain thing. Uh, what intervals do you consider? Well, it is actually the case you don't need to take a uniform t, uh, you, uh, uh, an interval 0 to t, you could take any positive bounded positive Lebesgue measure Borel set and blow it up by t. Not necessarily the unit interval and blow it up by t. That's so you get this inequality. And um, these sets here are Fölner. They have this property if you know what Fölner sets are. They are sets like this. If you take up so no, this is one-sided times. So, okay, let's go to note what happens now. This was plus. Okay, I forgot to remove the plus. Here is the removed plus. It's the same thing. And now I put a D there. So now we go to random fields. So D equal to one, two, sorry, is this is the space, the time space. And the processes are random fields that grow out here into space. So this is the origin of zeta prime. This is the origin of, of zeta. And the fields are the same. You just look at them from different origins. And this is true. This says we can construct a coupling like that, a single field, so you get both processes from different origins. If and only if the thing holds that you take a huge set around, around the origin and blow it up to infinity, then the distributions become the same. And this holds if and only if, and that is the neat and clean little condition, they have the same distribution on invariant sets. And what is this good for? Well, it turned out, much to my surprise, I was working on palm theory at the, by the site, not as part of coupling. And I, oh, I am this condition. Uh, yes, um, it's satisfied in that case. If you have a stationary point process, a stochastic process associated with a stationary point process, then it has a so-called palm version, which I'm not going to explain. If you haven't heard about it, it's quite complicated. But you can think of it as the following way. You have a stationary point process, and then you imagine that there happens to be a point at the origin. That is the distribution of that conditional thing is the palm version. It's like the Poisson process, stationary Poisson process, and you add an extra point at the origin. That's the palm version of the Poisson process. But this is a very general theory. And it turns out that um, this condition is satisfied there. And bingo, you have shift coupling, and you have this. And uh, when Yuval Perez saw this 20 years ago, he came to me afterward and thought, hi, Yuval, in case you <laughs> watch this. Uh, he said, uh, when you wrote up your first theorem, which uh, was abstract theorem for groups, he said, oh, it is one of these abstract nonsense talks. And then uh, up came this thing for the, in the palm theory that you can shift couple the stationary version and the palm version. Okay. And then he came and said, do you really mean that you can shift couple the stationary Poisson process and its palm version? Yes, it's, it's a special case. I said, and how would you do that? Oh, there's a theorem saying you can, but how would you do it? <laughs> And that was in 95, and it took, uh, guess, almost 10 years until uh, Yuval wrote a paper with um, Horoid. 2005. Yes, yes. And there he had it. So I don't have the time to explain it, but it's beautiful. 
and it's simple, and the idea is so beautiful. So you can do it so that you say, here is the stationary one, and I do this, and I have the palm version. And what is curious about this? It's the following. If this is the stationary origin, and you can move to, and here are points of a Poisson process, for instance, and you move over there, and there is a point there, this means that if you remove that point, you have a stationary Poisson process. So you can pick one of the points, remove it, and still have a stationary Poisson process. Pick another one, remove it, still have a stationary Poisson process. Go this ad infinitum. That's the curious thing with this. Extra head is a key word for this thing. OK, so I have to um, be very fast for the rest. We are up to random fields. And random fields are an additive group, topological group. Everything that holds on the slide, on this slide, works if you replace RD by a locally compact second countable topological group. I'm not going into the details of that, but this uh, means that uh, there's a whole field of there are many th fields out there where this could be applied, and <clears throat> there is something missing here. Have you seen it? There, was th there were three equivalences. Here are only two. Where is the limit result? Oh, I have it here. It's this one. Exactly the same. You take a uniform on a set BT, which is huge, and the, the two guys have the same distribution, approximately. But in order to do this, you need the existence of such sets. So you need the existence of sets with this property, because this is what you would need to plug in to this site, BT, BT, BT. This thing would need to go to zero for this limit two. And that is called amenability. So this is a classical or a standard <laughs> property that uh, is a subclass of groups which satisfy this. And if you are in that class, you have the limit result. I am done. I was asked this question. <laughs> so, oh, no, no, no. When wrote on the slide a working hypothesis. But then Yuval Perez said, mm. it is the definition of the word meaningful. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs>